Welcome to a brand new episode of the Michelle Tafoya podcast. Today, our guest is a former CIA ops officer, and he's got a lot to say about what's going on at the southern border and the northern border, for that matter, what's going on with the war in Ukraine and the United States involvement therein, and now all of these new fronts we could be facing. These are scary times. Let's hope he can make us feel a little bit better about it. He is next. Welcome to the Michelle Tafoya podcast. Well, our guest today, as I said, is a former CIA ops officer. His name is Brian Dean Wright. He is also the host of a podcast called The Wright Report. One thing I love about the podcasting world is... I, to the extent there's competition, but there's a lot of cross-pollinating and cross-promoting, and I'm glad to have him as a guest on my podcast today. As a former CIA ops officer, he can draw from experience and give us kind of a, a hint as to what the implications are about the southern border and its porousness. Uh, someone asked me recently, what just happened in Israel? Could that happen in America? Well, of course it could, and it already has multiple times. So why are we leaving that border open? Just a number of things I'm going to talk about with him. But first, are you one of those millions of Americans? You're either male, female, you are any age and you go, my hair is thinning. Why is this happening? I know it runs in my family, but what do I do about it? Well, finally, there is a solution and it's a real one. It delivers on its promise without the harsh side effects, unwanted chemicals, and awful smells. Thanks to our friends that develop GenuCell skincare, and you know how I feel about them. Provia uses a safe, natural ingredient called Procapil, and it effectively targets the three main causes of premature hair thinning and loss. It supports healthy scalp circulation, delivers nourishing nutrients, and it helps out with a healthy hair follicle anchoring to your scalp. Provia guarantees more hair on your head than in the shower or on your comb. It's effective, as I said, for men and women of any age. It's safe on colored, treated, and styled hair. It's really just that simple. And right now, new customers save over 50% off Provia's introductory package at proviahair.com slash Michelle. Every package includes a full 60-day supply of Provia Serum for daily use, plus Provia 30 Super Concentrate for faster, more noticeable results. Provia works guaranteed or 100% of your money back. See results for yourself right now. Do not wait. Proviahair.com slash Michelle. Proviahair, all one word, P-R-O-V-I-A hair.com slash Michelle. Remember one L. Proviahair.com slash M-I-C-H-E-L-E. Up next, Brian Dean Wright, former CIA ops officer, joins us to talk about all the concerns we're facing in America right now. Brian Dean Wright. I'm just going to call you Brian unless you want me to call you like BDW or <laughs> anything like, JFK. like that. JFK. No, Brian yeah. is fine. Brian is great. Welcome. It's good to meet you. This is the first time we're actually meeting, but uh, you know, I follow you on on X and I and I am fascinated by some of the things most of the things you post. Although some of them are are, you know, it's like, oh, the reality check that mm. we get, right? It's it's tough, but it's necessary. I introduced you to my listeners as a former CIA ops officer. How much can you tell us about what you did in that role? Uh, well, ask me questions. We'll see how far we can go. Yeah, you know <laughs> that I have this lifelong obligation to protect uh, secrets. I, I signed it, and uh, I, there's going to be some guys in a black van show up if I say too much. So, but we'll, we'll, we'll push. We'll push. We don't want that. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I, I know you've posted things in particular about the southern border. And this is a, this is an issue that it, it's so under my skin and I'm so mm. upset about it and I'm so angry about it, not because I am anti-immigration. You know, my, my, my father, his parents were immigrants uh, that came across the southern border legally. Um, mm. I'm of Hispanic background. I have nothing against people, but I have a lot for process. I believe in process and I believe in vetting people so that we don't have another 9-11 or any of the other terrorist attacks that have been attempted and even committed on this country. Someone asked me the other day, Brian, um, oh my gosh, what happened in Israel? They got across the border and all of this stuff happened and it was so quiet and secretive and it, could that happen here? And I, and I wanted to laugh. Yes, of course that can happen here. What would your answer have been to that person? 
Well, it would have been exactly yours. Look, I think most reasonable people can understand that if you have a border that is effectively porous or open and people are coming across in the millions now who are unvetted, uh, then you absolutely are going to get some percentage of them that are, are nothing else. They are criminals or they're folks who are up to no good. And certainly you have, whether it be the, the Chinese or you have other folks in the Middle East who seek to do us harm in terms of mm -hmm. sabotage teams, in terms of terror teams. All of that is absolutely a reasonable thing to say, hey, we should probably have a more secure southern border, if nothing else, for our national security. Uh, th so that is a reasonable thing, irrespective of your party affiliation. Right. That's what drives me nuts about this. Again, it's, you know, it, there are issues that are divisive, and this is one of them. We could go to yeah. abortion. We could go to the funding of Ukraine. We could go to any issue. And it seems to me people try to just find a chasm and d drive it right down the middle. Because let's be honest, it's good for fundraising. It's good for politicking. Yeah. But it isn't good for policy, and I don't know how how we've gotten so far away from our post-9-11 mentality in this country. How do you see that? How it, did this happen? It's shocking, isn't it? I mean, I mean I, as I watched, of course, the, the horrors of what happened in Israel a couple of weeks ago, and I think about my own experience. You know, I started the CIA less than, gosh, two months after the 9-11 attacks. And, and that memory uh, is burned into my experience and my memory of what it was like to live in that time where you look up in the sky and you would see, see a jet in those weeks after. And you're like, is this one coming down? And in my yeah. case, you know, the CIA headquarters, is this one coming down on me? Mm -hmm. uh, so we, I go from that baseline of experience as a very young man in my early 20s until now. And I see this border completely open uh, with record numbers, over 170 plus, I think, uh, you know, uh, illegal or I should say uh, folks on the terror watch list have come over. Right. I'm not sure the exact number. The point is, it's a lot. It used to be down to zero. We're now well over 100. And that's just the known folks. So yeah, it, it's it's really, really frightening. It's not just under, uh, I think, most of our skins from just a, a fairness perspective, a process perspective. But also, I think it's, most of us think, holy smokes, if this goes south, a whole bunch of people are going to die in this country. And it's going to make 9-11 look, look like a distant, not only memory, but just the, the memories of those people who have died. What was it for? Did we learn nothing? Uh, that's, learn I think, what, what a, a lot of us struggle with or think about. When you think about the way that things happened in Israel with Hamas getting in in, in, in a fashion that normally would not have been accessible to them, this was sheer yeah. surprise sheer terror and really astonishing given the level of defense in israel how do you think this happened look intel failure it was no doubt about it but hamas was very uh, uh, horrifically smart in how they set this up so we know now a couple of years ago the leadership of hamas what they started doing was trying to convince the israeli leaders that really what they were focused on was trying to govern the Gaza Strip. They wanted economic progress. It was less about trying to destroy Israel, which of course is at the very root and the base of Hamas. So they started doing this over a course of, of a couple of years, and it basically allowed some degree of, of atrophying of the concern or the fear within the Israeli leadership, within the Israeli military and intelligence services to think, you know, maybe we turned a corner with these guys. Maybe Hamas really is going to focus on allowing its own people to thrive. It wasn't true. The entire time Hamas was working with Hezbollah, with Iran, with Islamic Jihad, and they were planning for this very horrific day. And they were collecting incredible intelligence, almost certainly from Iran, about each of these different uh, little villages, about how, in, in fact, all the, the walls and the fences were operating, where the weakest spots were. Then they used some really, really, I, I, we could say, not cutting edge technology, but certainly newer technology, drone. So they started attacking some of the cameras. They brought down the communication system. They brought down the cameras. They started attacking the, you know, some of the watchtowers that would warn. And then they started using bulldozers and trucks, and they just smashed through you know, through brute force. And then, of course, once they got in, they had all this intelligence they were collecting over the course of a couple of years about how these little villages operated, their security postures, how they would respond to an attack. So they knew all of this the day that it launched, and that's why it was so horrifically effective. I horrifically effective is is the term we we have to remember and of course you mentioned hezbollah you mentioned uh palestinian jihadism or jihadists and iran and i think um there are so many people brian who are still saying this is palestine just trying to get its land back mm. and i think that's just a faulty assumption this is hamas which really 
I don't think they have Palestine's best interests at heart. They've got Iran's best interests at heart. Is that fair to say? Well, I think it's twofold. I think you know, both of these enemies live together on the same roof and they have you know, overlapping interests. So clearly Iran wants its leadership, the, the Ayatollah wants uh, Israel gone uh, for its own ideological and, and religious reasons. You know, I think Hamas wants the, the same for many of those same reasons, but it's also very personal for a lot of those Palestinians. Some of their parents, grandparents, great-grandparents were removed from their land. So it's this mix of of religious or, or uh, you know, the, the foundational belief that this would be an Arab land, a Muslim land. And then on top of that, you have, of course, the personal piece that this was my family's land. And then, of course, you just start getting pride, ego, money. A lot of these guys, if they could get that land back, they would certainly claim part of it for themselves. So you have this Duke's mixture of really awful motivations by a lot of really horrible people. But the bottom line is they want Israel gone. They want Israel eradicated, every Jew gone from that land. That is, without a doubt, a, a very clear motivation for all parties involved. Uh, so I, I really think that that is part of the complexity that uh, so many people around the world try to wrestle with. Of how do we solve this? Well, all roads eventually lead back to Iran, but that creates a whole big other hornet's nest of a challenge to, to, to take them on. But at bare minimum, uh, Gaza Strip cannot remain as it is. And I think that that's what Netanyahu and others in Israel realize. I think that's what most people in the West realize as well. These guys can't stay there. They've got to be removed. They've got to be removed. But but then I come back to, you know, you can remove them, but then there's a vacuum. And what fills it? And you still got the question of Hezbollah, which is that other yeah. terrorist group, which many people think will make Hamas look like, uh, can I use that old phrase, the JV team? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, I... I sit here and wonder, what are we on the precipice of here? Yeah. You know, what are we facing? And it, it really, I think it, it can, we can look at Russia invading Ukraine as maybe the genesis of this power shift of this, mm. this idea that, hey, we're going to be okay if we do this because no one's punishing us. Um, yeah. I don't know. I know you have strong feelings about Ukraine too. What, where do you start there? Well, let me pivot just briefly back uh, to the Gaza Strip. And let's talk about one thing that isn't really popularly uh, discussed, and it ought to be. You talk about what if we get rid of Hamas, what comes next, the vacuum. Well, one of the things that we know going back to 2007 and then again in 2021, we have two different data points that tell us that actually the Palestinians in Gaza Strip support Hamas. In fact, what we saw back in 2021, the Associated Press reported this really shocking poll, which was when Hamas attacked Israel, in fact, the more attacks they did, the more that the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip supported Hamas. This is in addition, of course, to back in 2006 and seven when the Palestinians voted Hamas into power. So you're quite right to say what happens when Hamas, or when Hamas leaves or when they're eradicated, if you've got a group of people who are so uh, virulently in support of either Hamas or an ideology that would embrace what Hamas does, which is including, of course, terror, which we saw two weeks ago. So that is absolutely something that we have to be honest about. We have to wrestle with that. A lot of Arab governments have to assist um, in, in the governance of that uh, Gaza Strip there uh, from future forward. That's got to be a part of that, too, because that uh, issue of Palestinian support for Hamas, it's real. And we can't pretend like it's not real if we're going to be serious about how do we govern that territory. It may be we, real, but is it real from the standpoint that they really do support the methods of Hamas, or is it that they're kind of under under their under their thumb, like they they, yeah. they just they don't have another way? Well, it's a great and a very fair question. So, what I would offer you, in addition to the 2006 election, the 2021 poll. We also have a poll that actually came out this weekend of American Muslims, and they talked about what percentage of them believed that Hamas was uh, right, that they believe in what Hamas does. And so this question was put forth uh, about 4 million American Muslims, and there was a, you know, obviously a smaller sample, and it showed about 40% of American Muslims do not accept or believe in Hamas or their terror. 60% do. And that's a pretty, I think, alarming thing to think about. It was a very reputable pollster who came out with that over the weekend. So I think that we can do two things. We can talk about how there are a lot of incredible, wonderful Muslims in this world, in this country. I've worked with them side by side, taking on a radical Islam. We should be celebrating those voices, lifting them up, embracing them, echoing them, amplifying them, and at the same time, acknowledging that there is this other strain, and it's not a small one. 
And we'd never really truly wrestled with that over the past 20 plus years since the 9-11 attacks. That radical or Salafist or Deobandi Islam, we got to talk about that. We got to educate ourselves about it. And we have to do it arm in arm with fellow Muslims who were like, this stuff is going to destroy my faith and my community and my nation. So I think we can do all of those things. We just have to have really good, thoughtful, careful leadership to have that conversation. Before we move on, I, I, I promise we'll get to Ukraine, but you mentioned Iran, and it seems to me the timing of this also coincides with this normalization of relations between you know the Arab world and Israel. We yeah. saw these Abraham Accords. We saw uh, Saudi Arabia coming to the table ready to normalize relations with Israel. How bad would that be for yeah. Iran if that actually happened? And how much of that was a motivator? Yeah, you were, you were absolutely spot on. It was absolutely a motivator. And it wasn't just between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Obviously, you're, you're bringing up the very fantastic Abraham Accords. So this had been, uh, this train of peace had been rolling down the tracks for a good two to five years. And you saw Iran and you saw different uh, Islamic jihadist groups who were saying that this is very, very bad because they're going to solve this issue and Israel is going to be forever in the Middle East and the Palestinians are going to be left behind. And so they were profoundly motivated to make sure that that train going down the track towards peace was derailed. And that is, in fact, what happened uh, in no small, uh, small part on October 7th. That peace train was derailed. And now we have to start from anew. How and when that happens, I don't know. It's going to be many, many months, probably years before we get there again. But who knows? You know, peace can happen in the most unlikely places. Oh, and we can only <laughs> we can only pray for it as we've Amen. been doing f throughout uh, time immemorial. Um, OK, Ukraine. Russia invades Ukraine. It's on Joe yeah. Biden's watch. This probably could. Many people believe it could have been prevented. What's your your approach to that whole issue? Yeah, there was this very important window of time right before Russia invaded the three to six months before when it became very clear from an intel perspective that the Russians and uh, Putin were building up. That was when we had the time to solve this because it wasn't solved properly, Mr. Biden, unfortunately, and European leaders equally. This isn't just a partisan thing. They made some profound mistakes, uh, in part because they needed Russian natural gas. So ultimately, I think a lot of people there just didn't really care about Ukraine until they really had to. And now they do. So now we've got a mess, an absolutely expensive mess, a hundred billion plus dollars expensive mess for this country. Uh, Europe is, is pitching in a lot less. So yeah, it, it's, a, it's a profound challenge that, you know, I think most Americans, if you look at polling right now, they're saying, look, we've got multiple issues in this country, the failed Southern border. We've got a crime issue. We've got you know, skyrocketing healthcare costs. We've got a national debt where our interest payments are making record, you know, hitting record highs. We've got some seriously profound, important issues here that we have to dis, uh, deal with let alone just the, the war material that has to be created for not one, not two, but possibly three wars in Ukraine, Israel, and God forbid, with China. Right. So I think what most Americans are saying is, look, we need to really reestablish what our priorities are. And most of those are domestic. It doesn't mean we don't care about international issues, but we kind of have to get back to, to what President Washington talked about when he issued his farewell address, which is, look, if you're going to get engaged and involved in stuff abroad, make it rare and make it exceptional and make it really about America's fundamental interests. And I'm paraphrasing, obviously, good old President Washington, but that really was his argument, was beware of foreign entanglements, especially in Europe, he talked about. And I think that this war in Ukraine is a case in point of that, where European powers could and should step up to a much greater degree than they than they uh, are currently. In fact, the, the Berlin right now, they, uh, they said they were going to dramatically increase their military spending about two months ago, end of August. They backed off that pledge which tells me they don't really think that Russia is a concern, right? Or they don't really want to resolve this Ukrainian issue. If they're dialing back their military spending, that, that's a pretty clear signal of what they think of the threat. Well, I, and others would say, you know, it it's true um, that there is a lot going on at home that we seems to get neglected, which is shocking to me, but nonetheless, here we are. Yeah. But we do need our friends around the world, and that could include Ukraine. Um, certainly it would seem to include Taiwan and it certainly includes Israel. So we need those friends for our own, like, as you said, uh, you know, those are benefits for the United hmm. States. Those are interests of ours that we, you know, we need to be there for them so that they are there for us. So is, uh, I mean, we're optimistically, 
Now let's start pessimistically. <laughs> pessimistically, where are we headed right now? Are we looking at a potential three front war? The short answer is yes. I mean, we've already got certainly the one in Ukraine. I think that this one in Israel is, um, boy, there are just a lot of cooks in the kitchen on this one in terms of potential interests, who who wants what territory, who's got what weapons. And then this third potential conflict with China, you know, it is brewing and it has for years now. But President Xi of China has said he wants the, the military to be ready in his country by the year 2027 to take Taiwan back. Whether he will do it in just those few short years, that's unknown. Uh, but we have to be ready. The Pentagon is trying to in the next 18 months to, to not match them ship for ship because China is already beating us on that. They were, they're also beating us on missiles for what it's worth. So what we're trying to do is we are building out our drone or UAV capabilities to just swarm the Taiwan Strait with thousands, if not tens of thousands of, of drones connected to artificial intelligence. That is what the Pentagon is focused on. It's going to probably take 18 months to get that program up and running. It's called Replicator. That is the big one. So from my optic, we've got the next 12 to 18 months where China knows that it has an advantage. Perhaps it doesn't have the advantage it wants militarily perfectly. Um, but once the United States comes on board with this AI system, this replicator program that can just swarm all of its jets and its its uh, boats and such, you know, tens of thousands of these things, China knows it loses its advantage. So that means that it's motivated or it's incentivized to act sooner rather than later. And so that's why I look at Ukraine, yeah. Israel and China. And I just think, boy, we live in a very dangerous time. It, it is that. And you say 2027 is when Xi Jinping hopes to be ready to do that. I I predict it's going to be sooner than that. I don't have yeah. any intel. I just have a gut feel about it, uh, given the rest of the world. These drones, I can't help but think, you know, where are we getting the parts for these drones? <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, the vast majority of uh, drones in this country or this world, rather, are made in China. Uh, yeah. So how in the hell are we supposed to trust the what we're getting? I mean, is this I, I, I this is yeah. from a very uh, listen, I have no intel at all. Right. So uh, but but the, well, I can the, help common, you with that a little bit. The, the common sense person in me goes, you know, most of this stuff's made in China. So mm -hmm. how are we supposed to. <laughs> say that we're spending all this money with the Chinese so we can be ready to attack, attack the Chinese. I, it's very yeah. odd to me. Yeah, so there are two things that are happening. First, the Pentagon is trying to use the existing money that it has to, to build up a domestic base uh, of a drone industry, at least a couple of different providers. The issue is, of course, there are a lot of bits and pieces that, goes into, that go into those drones, and not all of them are going to be able to be made in this country or through an ally. A lot of that is going to be made in China. In fact, we see that with solar panels. We see that with batteries for electric vehicles. We yep. see that. For, I mean, it's across the board. We all know this, right? So you are quite right to say that some of those pieces are going to be made in China. And we, in fact, we might even surprised and think they're, they're here, they're made here, but in fact, they're not. We're seeing that in part of our, our jet fighter program. Some of the magnets are actually made in China. Oopsie. So you're right. Uh, we're going to have to make sure working with our Pentagon that they, they scrub those devices and make sure that China can't control them. Yes, you were correct. This is the problem with shipping out so much of our manufacturing. This is one of the many yes. problems with shipping out so much of our manufacturing. How, do, how are we supposed to trust others to? It? Oh, yeah. gosh. Okay. So at the end of my interviews, I like to ask this question in particular right now. I need to hear this. Yeah. What gives you hope right now? So I think that there are a lot of good things happening in this country, in this world. Uh, you know, I think on the medical front, we're seeing a lot of really great innovations with artificial intelligence. We're finding, in fact, some treatments for things like autism and other uh, diseases because AI can work so fast and they can work through so many different uh, parts of the human body. It can find out what medicines actually work for things that are already on the shelf, I should say, some of these medicines. So I love watching that field and that's so inspiring and so encouraging for me, especially autism, actually. That's another one that, you know, touches my family and, and those that I love. So I think there are some great innovations there. And I also think that the, the the spirit of the American people, it's still alive and well. I don't know when you go out and you meet with people and, and you talk to folks, common sense is still there. It might not be common because we don't talk about it a lot on, on our media or sometimes we just feel overwhelmed. But I think when you sit down, most people of most folks are reasonable. I think they want to find common sense solutions to stuff. So I'm hopeful. I'm bullish on the American uh, future and, and the American people. I think we're good folks. We just, we've got a lot of problems we have to face, but uh, we'll get there. We do. I, 
I'd love to share your bullishness right now. I uh, and maybe I do spend too much time watching the the smaller, louder groups, and I hope that is a vocal minority that are acting on anti-Semitic instincts right now. That it's very painful for me to see. I'll never understand yeah. it. I'll never understand it. And and all of the divisions that people like to drum up in this country. I, I mm. again. Um, I don't think we're teaching history well, world history or American Amen. history well. Amen. I, and, Gosh. you know, and, and that is that to think that our youth are being pumped full of ideas that aren't based on legitimate fact or history. Yeah, that's freaking scary to me. And I, I, I just hope parents are waking up to this. And um, yeah. anyway. Oh, yeah. I, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you, I don't know how much time we have, but I recently had a conversation with a 24 year old who was just in college here a couple of years ago, and he was very much uh, sort of this avowed socialisty kind of stuff. And the conversation now is 100 percent different. He was like, what was I thinking? That was ridiculous. Really? All that. Yeah. So I'm like, all right. So just good conversations, good life experience, seeing the world, how it actually works, seeing the fraud of organizations like Black Lives Matter or socialist organizations who are now you know, celebrating paragliders jumping into Israel with their memes and such. It's just waking a lot of people up that I think just were completely lost in some of this bonkers uh, ideology. And I still, I still see it. Sadly, I mean, I, I hope that more people are opening their eyes to this. And, and you know, Dave Chappelle, I love you, but you know what? If someone who is applying for a job in my corporation supports terrorism, uh, they're not getting a job in my corporation. Amen. Even though you know, look, yes, I am adamant about free speech, but free speech has been shown to have consequences particularly yeah. when it's in support of these weren't paragliders going into military bases in Israel. These were paragliders going into a peace concert and right. attacking innocent civilians. This right. was disgusting on every level. I can't even think about it. Uh, it's yeah. so disturbing to me. So um, I I'm sorry, but if, if you are a law student and you're going to sign on to that letter at Harvard, I applaud law firms that say we don't have a place for you in this firm. I, I, I absolutely do. Choices have consequences, don't yes. they? So yep. if we sign up for silly things, silly consequences happen to us. What do they say? Yeah. Play silly games, win, win silly prizes. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's been a pleasure to chat with you. And I hope this is not the last time we get to talk. Can't wait to do it again. All right. Thank you so much. I, I, I appreciate your willingness to talk. Uh, we didn't get too deep in the weeds about the CIA, and I know because we don't want the black vans pulling up at your house. We really don't. We want Next us time. to make it. Let's do it. <laughs> Next time. Thank you so much. Uh, Such folks, a pleasure. Thank you. As always, I end my podcast by saying be brave and do good. And maybe just by doing those two things, you can make a tiny difference in the world, a, a little one. So try it out, and we will see you next time. <laughs>